Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege once again of gathering together to open your holy word. We ask that that word will speak to us, that it will not return unto you void, but that it will accomplish the work for which you sent it. We claim the promise of your presence in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. The Bible presents only two roads or two ways. The first way is the way to heaven, and the second is the way to perdition. I'd like to begin by reading uh, from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, in verses 13 and 14 about those two ways, and only two ways. Jesus spoke these words, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. So there's the broad way and the narrow way, only two ways. One leads to life and the other one leads to death. Let's read a few other verses that present these two different roads. 1 John chapter 2 and verses 15 and 16. Do not love the world or the things in the world. Here the beloved disciple is speaking to believers. So believers are on one side and he's saying to them, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So there is of the world and not of the world. The wide way and the narrow way. Another text that we've already read before is James 4 and verse 4. James 4, verse 4. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Could we change that around by saying that friendship with God is enmity for the world? I think that would be fair, right? Even though the text doesn't say it. If you're a friend of God, you're an enemy of the world. If you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God. So it says, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Two ways. The narrow way, the broad way. Friend of the world and friend of God. Lover of the world and lover of God. Jesus also spoke of these two ways in Matthew 6, verse 24. Matthew 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Once again, either God or mammon. Let's read one final passage as we introduce our study together. 2 Corinthians 6 and verses 14 through 16. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 16. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. So how many groups do you have? Believers and unbelievers. And the counsel is do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And then he goes on to say, Come ye out from them, and be ye separate. So there are only two ways. 
the broad way and the narrow way, the world or God, believers, unbelievers. But now I want to share with you that at least before the close of probation, there is a third category of individual. Not those who are openly unbelievers that are on the road to perdition, not those who are clearly and openly on the road to salvation because they are allied to God. There is a third category during this probationary time, and that third category is what we might call the mixed multitude. You see, there are those individuals among God's people that are not of God's people. They are worldlings in sheep's clothing. They are worldly, although they call themselves Christians. They are a mixed multitude. They journey the wide path, but they join those who are on the narrow path to entice them and constantly tempt them to do evil. These individuals are more dangerous than the open unbeliever, than the person who never claimed to believe. So let's talk a little bit about this expression, the mixed multitude. Where does this expression come from? Well, it actually comes from the story of the pilgrimage of Israel from Egypt to Canaan. If you remember, terrible plagues fell upon Egypt. All of society was turned upside down. Nature was in total disarray and disorder. Nobody wanted to live in Egypt anymore. Let's read Exodus chapter 12, 37 and 38 about those who left Egypt. Obviously, all who left claimed to be children of Israel. But now notice Exodus 12, 37 and 38. Then the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot besides children. Now notice this. A mixed multitude went up with them also, and flocks and herds a great deal of livestock. So you notice, along with Israel went out a mixed multitude. In a moment, we're going to describe what that mixed multitude was like. But first of all, allow me to say a few things about the pilgrimage of Israel from Egypt to Canaan. You see, Israel left Egypt and journeyed to Canaan. The purpose of their trek through the wilderness was to cut out and purge themselves from the worldly customs and practices that they had learned in Egypt. Their dress was to change. They were to get over idolatry. They were to remove their jewelry. They were to partake of a different diet. Their music would be different. They would cease to dance. Their entertainment would be different. God proposed in leading them across the desert to the promised land to teach them how to live in the land where they were going, to dispose of all of the practices that they had learned in Egypt and to learn a totally new lifestyle centered in God. God wanted them to enter the land of Canaan, a healthy, happy, and holy people according to the spirit of prophecy different than they were when they had lived in Egypt. You see, the life in Canaan was going to be different from their life in Egypt. Thus, the purpose of their journey was to purge themselves of the Egyptian lifestyle and learn God's lifestyle so that they could enjoy the, to the fullest their new home where everything would be different than what they were accustomed to. Of course, Satan was opposed to this project. And he did his utmost to destroy Israel from outside. For example, 
by sending serpents uh, to bite them, venomous serpents, to get the Egyptians to come after Israel, to destroy them. Satan tried to destroy Israel from outside, but he could not. So seeing that he could not destroy the Israelites from outside, he decided to introduce a leavening agent within. And this leavening agent was the mixed multitude. These people joined with God's people out of convenience, but they did not leave the Egyptian lifestyle completely behind. They were half Christians, we might say, half converted, lax in their lifestyle, careless, and they were a constant temptation and trouble to the children of Israel. They constantly suggested a return to Egypt. By the way, there were two things that motivated this mixed multitude to be with God's people. Number one, to escape the dire situation in Egypt. They did not like all of the disease and all of the fact that the economy had been thrown upside down, all of the terrible things that were happening in nature. They wanted to escape all of these things. And they had heard that there was, there was this wonderful land that flowed with milk and honey. In other words, their purpose was a mercenary purpose, to escape suffering and to enter the promised land. Let me read a few statements from the Spirit of Prophecy on the character of the mixed multitude. The first statement we find in the book Patriarchs and Prophets, page 281. She wrote, In this multitude were not only those who were actuated by faith in the God of Israel, but also a far greater number, notice that all of the mixed multitude were not apostate, the greater number of them was. So once again, in this multitude were not only those who were actuated by faith in the God of Israel, but also a far greater number who desired to escape from the plagues, or who followed in the wake of the moving multitudes merely from excitement and curiosity. In other words, they were pumped up, they were excited about this new project, this new endeavor. And then she wrote, this class were ever a hindrance and a snare to Israel. So they were a hindrance and a snare to God's faithful people. On page 408 of Patriarchs and Prophets, Ellen White wrote about this mixed multitude. The mixed multitude that came up with the Israelites from Egypt were a source of continual temptation and trouble. They professed to have renounced idolatry and to worship the true God. So notice they were not open on believers. They were not secular people. They were individuals who professed, according to this, to have renounced idolatry and to worship the true God. But their early education and training had molded their habits and character and they were more or less corrupted with idolatry and with irreverence for God. They were the oftenest, the ones, to stir up strife and were the first to complain, and they leavened the camp with their idolatrous practices and their murmurings against God. Are you catching the picture? They were with Israel, but they were not of Israel. They, their main purpose was not to live a holy, sanctified life. Their purpose was to escape the sufferings of their previous life, and they looked forward to the benefits of the promised land, hoping to live the same lifestyle that they have lived while they were in the land of Egypt. It's very interesting that the Spirit of Prophecy tells us that most of the great apostasies of Israel were due to the mixed multitude. I'll give you a list. The idolatry at Mount Sinai when they worshiped the golden calf, that was instigated by the mixed multitude. When Israel clamored for flesh foods instead of manna, the mixed multitude was behind it. When there was no water, 
the mixed multitude was behind it. Constantly the mixed multitude riled up the people to criticize the leadership of Moses. You remember the case of an individual who went out to pick up sticks to build a fire on the Sabbath? We're told in Numbers chapter 15 that he was one of the mixed multitude. God had said, don't do that. He said, I'm going to do it and let's see what God does to me. So this open rebellion led to his death. He was a member of the mixed multitude, had no reverence for the Sabbath. And on the borders of Canaan, the complaining about when the spies went out to spy out the land, the complaints were begun by the mixed multitude. So every time almost that apostasy arose in Israel on their road to Canaan, it was due to this mixed multitude. Let's notice just two episodes that involve this mixed multitude. We can't study all of the list of apostasies that I've mentioned. You can find these in the book Patriarchs and Prophets. Let's just deal for a moment with the apostasy at Mount Sinai, the worshiping of the golden calf. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 315 and 316, we find this description of Ellen White about what happened at Mount Sinai. Especially was this the case with the mixed multitude. They were impatient to be on their way to the land of promise. They were saying, why are we camping out here at Mount Sinai? Let's get with it. Let's go to the promised land. See, they served the Lord out of mercenary motives. They wanted the reward. It wasn't because they loved the Lord. So they were impatient to be on their way to the land of promise. The land flowing with milk and honey. See, that's what they wanted. It was only on condition of obedience that the goodly land was promised them. But they had lost sight of this. The mixed multitude had been the first to indulge murmuring and impatience. And they were the leaders in the apostasy that followed. So if it had not been for the mixed multitude, Israel would not have apostatized. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 318, we find these words also about the apostasy at Mount Sinai. The people of Israel, especially the mixed multitude, would be constantly disposed to rebel against God. They would also murmur against their leader and would grieve him by their unbelief and stubbornness. And it would be a laborious and soul-trying work to lead them through to the promised land. Their sins had already forfeited the favor of God, and justice called for their destruction. The Lord therefore proposed to destroy them and make of Moses a mighty nation. Are you catching the picture? There was a group with Israel. They were not Egyptians. They didn't stay in Egypt. They were not truly worshipers of God. They were a third element, individuals who claimed to serve the true God, but leavened Israel and led them into sin and apostasy. Of course, there's not such a group in the Adventist church today, right? We'll talk about that a little bit later. Now let's deal with the manna episode. First of all, let's read what the Bible has to say about the manna. Was the manna a boring, tasteless, bitter food? No, it was a delicious food. And by the way, in one food it had all the necessary nutrients. It had all of the protein, carbohydrates, vitamins, and minerals in one food. Superfood, that was really a superfood. You know, people talk today about superfoods. The manna was a superfood, and it was delicious. Notice Numbers 11, verses 7 and 8, where we find a description of the manna. Numbers 11, 7 and 8. Now, the manna was like coriander seed, and its color like the color of delium, which is kind of like an off-white. The people went about and gathered it, ground it on millstones, or beat it in the mortar, cooked it in pans, and make cakes out of it. In other words, it was very versatile. They could use it in many different ways. And its taste was like the taste of pastry prepared with oil. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? 
we're getting around lunchtime now, so even I am getting hungry. Exodus 16, verse 31, tells us something else that's interesting about the manna. It says there in Exodus 16, 31, and the house of Israel called its name manna. By the way, the word manna means what is it? Because when Israel went out, when it first fell, they go out and they say, manna, manna, what is it, what is it? Because manna had never fallen before. So it says, and the house of Israel called its name manna. And it was like white coriander seed, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. God has a sweet tooth. Of course, this is a good kind of sweets, right? So, so the manna was delicious. It was a wonderful food that God provided because they couldn't plant in the wilderness. You know, so God says, I'm going to give them for 40 years this wonderful superfood. But the mixed multitude remembered all of the rich foods that they had had when they were in Egypt. You see, they had left Egypt, but Egypt had not left them. Let's read Numbers chapter 11 and verse 4, as well as verse 5. Now the mixed multitude, see they are the ones again, who were among them yielded to intense craving. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, now did you notice something interesting here? Now the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense craving, so who is it that yielded to the intense craving? The mixed multitude, right? But now notice, so the children of Israel also wept again and said. <laughs> Are you catching the picture? So the mixed multitude, they begin to murmur, and it becomes contagious. The people begin to murmur as well. What do they say? Who will give us meat to eat? Oh, we remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our whole being is dried up. There is nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. How ungrateful were these people, instigated by the mixed multitude. By the way, should they have been grateful to God for God sustaining them in their trek across the wilderness? Of course. I mean, imagine a heavenly bakery where every day, except the Sabbath, Enough manna fell for a million men, not counting women and children. That must have been some bakery. In fact, the psalm, Psalm 78, calls it the food of angels. Not because the angels eat it, but because the angels bake it. <laughs> it's angels' food. Maybe that's where the, where the expression angel food cake comes from. Although angel food cake does not have nearly all of the nutrients that the manna had. Notice Psalm 106 and verses 14 and 15. So the people are bored stiff of eating manna. They want all of the rich variety that they had in Egypt, including flesh foods. Psalm 106 verses 14 and 15 tells us, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tested God in the desert. So God says to them, okay, you don't like the diet that I proposed? I'll give you what you want. Numbers 11, beginning with verse 18 through verse 20. Then you shall say to the people, God is instructing Moses, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow and you shall eat meat. For you have wept in the hearing of the Lord, saying, who will give us meat to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Notice, what are, what are they thinking about? They're thinking about returning to the lifestyle in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you meat, and you shall eat. You shall eat, not one day, nor two days, nor five days, nor ten days, nor twenty days, but for a whole month, until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you, because you have despised the Lord who is among you. How did they show that they despised him? By rejecting his diet that God had established. You have despised him. It says here, who is among you and have wept before him saying, why did we ever come up out of Egypt? So now God sends quail. Notice verse 31. 
Now a wind went out from the Lord, and it brought quail from the sea, and left them fluttering near the camp, about a day's journey on this side, and about a day's journey on the other side, all around the camp, and about two cubits above the surface of the ground. They're flying super low, and they're like a cloud, the quail. And the people, they show that they have this severe craving, they go out, And they gather the quail much more than what you need for one meal. Notice verse 32. And the people stayed up all that day, all night, and all the next day, and gathered the quail. He who gathered least gathered ten homers, and they spread them out for themselves all around the camp. What was the result? Numbers 11 verse 33 states, however, while the meat was still between their teeth, before it was chewed, the wrath of the Lord was aroused against the people, and the Lord struck the people with a very great plague. Allow me to read you a statement from the Spirit of Prophecy where she amplifies what happened in this particular episode of Israel's history. He came This is Satan. He came with his temptations first to the mixed multitude. The believing Egyptians and stirred them up to seditious murmurings. They would not be content with the healthful food that God had provided for them. Their depraved appetites craved a greater variety, especially flesh meats. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 377, Ellen White adds, After three days' journey, open complaints were heard. These originated with the mixed multitude. See, once again, those who were with Israel, but they were not of Israel, if you please. These originated with the mixed multitude, many of whom were not fully united with Israel and were continually watching for some cause of censure. The complainers were not pleased with the direction of the march, and they were continually finding fault with the way in which Moses was leading them. Though they well knew that he, as well as they, was following the guiding cloud, dissatisfaction is contagious, and it soon spread in the encampment. Are you catching the picture? A group of individuals who left Egypt, but Egypt did not lead them. A group that led Israel constantly into apostasy on different occasions during her history. Now what I would like us to do is turn to another story that illustrates something very similar to this. We're talking about the story of Balaam. Go with me to Numbers 23, and we'll read verse 21 and verse 23. Numbers 23, 21 and 23. You see, the principle is this. Satan tried to destroy Israel from outside. When he was not successful in destroying Israel through the serpents and the Egyptians, etc., he said, there's a better way of doing it. I'll just infiltrate Israel with a group of people that will cause apostasy and complaining. In other words, an enemy from within. The same occurs with the story of Balaam. Now, I think you probably know the story of Balaam. Balak, a king, wanted Balaam to curse Israel. And Balaam, you know, he said, well, for a certain amount of money, I would do it. So Balaam goes to a high ledge where he can see the entire encampment of Israel, all well organized. And I want you to notice what Balaam said to Balak after this seeing this view of Israel in the valley. He tells Balak regarding God, he has not observed iniquity in Jacob, nor has he seen wickedness in Israel. In other words, they were living in harmony with the God's principles. The Lord is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. God brings them out of Egypt. He has strength like a wild ox. 
For there is no sorcery against Jacob, nor any divination against Israel. It now must be said of Jacob and of Israel, Oh, what God has done. Are you catching the picture? Israel was in a proper relationship with the Lord at this point. And Balaam is saying, no matter how much I try to curse Israel, I can't. Because there is no sorcery and no divination that can go against these people whose relationship with the Lord is proper. So Balaam tries again. Balak tells him, maybe it's because you saw all of Israel in the valley dwelling in peace. Maybe if you went to a different place where you can't see them, you would curse them. And so Balaam goes. Notice chapter 23 and verse 28. Then Balak said to Balaam, please come. I will take you to another place. Perhaps it will please God that you may curse them for me from there. And of course, Balaam was not able to curse them from outside. So now, Balaam comes up with a plan. He says, if we cannot curse Israel from outside and lead God to destroy them from outside, maybe the best way to do it would be to infiltrate them from the inside and lead them from a pot for a, to apostasy so that God will withdraw his protection from them. If you can't fight them, join them. Corrupt them from inside so that then God cannot guarantee his protection and Israel can be destroyed. And so now Satan goes to plan B. Instead of destroying them from outside, he's going to infiltrate them from inside and corrupt them from inside. Notice Numbers 25, and we'll read verses 1 to 3, and then we will read also verse 9. Numbers 25, verses 1 through 3, and verse 9. Now Israel remained in an acacia grove, and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. You see, the women of Moab started infiltrating Israel. This is an enemy within. You know, it's not a military attack. It's these harlots, they're coming in, and they're infiltrating Israel. Continue saying in verse 2, they invited the people, the Moabites did, to the sacrifices of their gods. And the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel was joined to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. And those, verse 9, and those who died in the plague were 24,000. Are you catching the picture of what Satan did here? He was not able to destroy them from outside. So what he did was introduce apostasy inside, and as a result, God withdrew his protection. 24,000 people died in Israel as a result of the infiltrated apostasy. Now, I want us to go to the book of Revelation. Very, very interesting parallel to what we've just studied from the Old Testament story. Before we go to Revelation chapter 2, I want to give you a little bit of background. As you know, Revelation chapters 2 and 3 describe seven churches that were in Asia Minor. Now these were literal churches that were there. But the seven churches represent seven periods of church history. In other words, each church represents a certain period in the flow of church history from apostolic times till the last church, the church of the end time. Now, the second church is the church of Smyrna. The first church, obviously, is the apostolic church, the church of Ephesus. The word Ephesus means desirable. Who would not want to belong to the early church? See, the names of the churches are very significant as well. So you have the, the apostolic church. The church is going out conquering and to conquer. That's the, the first seal. And uh, Satan is, of course, not too happy about this. So what the devil does is now he is going to launch a persecution against the church from outside to destroy the church from outside. 
Notice Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, which describes the church of Smyrna. By the way, if you read the entire message to the church of Smyrna, you'll discover that there's much death language. Death is a highlight in the story of the church of Smyrna. It says there in Revelation 2 verse 10, Do not fear, this is Jesus speaking, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. But then they are told, be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. What does the word Smyrna mean? The word Smyrna means bittersweet myrrh. And do you know what, was, what myrrh was used for in those times? It was used to embalm the dead. Very interesting that this church, which by the way is the church that was persecuted by the Roman emperors, you know, uh, shortly after uh, the apostolic period, uh, the, the, they're being persecuted right and left. They're being mowed down. Satan tried to destroy the church by persecution from outside. In fact, the church father, Tertullian, spoke these words. The more you mow us down, the more we are. The blood of Christians is seed. The pagan temples were emptying. The, a terrible persecution came upon the church because the church was in a proper relationship with the Lord. In fact, the great church historian Eusebius describes what took place at the Council of Nicaea in the year 325. There were delegates from all over the empire, and he says that they had all kinds of scars. They were missing limbs, they were missing eyes because of the persecution that had been launched from the year 303 till the year 313 by the emperor Diocletian. In other words, Nicaea was right after the terrible period of persecution against Christians. And people looked at the Christians who were dying right and left. They said, hey, these people are willing to die for what they believe, so they must be, what they believe must be willing to live for. You see, Christianity, by being persecuting, cure persecuted, was actually growing like a California grass fire. Ellen White wrote, in Great Controversy, page 46, the early Christians were indeed a peculiar people. Their blameless deportment and unswerving faith were a continual reproof that disturbed the sinner's peace. Though few in numbers, without wealth, position, or honorary titles, they were a terror to evildoers wherever their character and doctrines were known. Therefore, they were hated by the wicked, even as Abel was hated by the ungodly Cain. For the same reason that Cain slew Abel, did those who sought to throw off the restraint of the Spirit of God put to death God's people. So the devil is trying to destroy the church from outside. And the more he persecutes, the more the church grows. Because people are saying, hey, if these people are willing to die for what they believe, what they believe in must be worthwhile. So the devil says, this is being counterproductive. I'm shooting myself in the foot. So I have to go to a plan B. And the plan B was to infiltrate the church. Notice Revelation 2 verse 14. This is speaking about the next church, the church called Pergamum. The word Pergamum means Acropolis or elevation. You see, because this is the church of the apostasy. The church that was in the valley of persecution now is placed at the heights. This is the period of Constantine. Notice Revelation 2 verse 14. Here Jesus says to the church of Pergamum, but I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam. Now, isn't that interesting? Where would we have to go in order to understand what the doctrine of Balaam is? We have to go back to the story of Balaam. Satan tried to destroy Israel from outside, couldn't, so he infiltrates them. And then they have great destruction and apostasy. 
So it says, those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel. That's the doctrine of Balaam, putting a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. You see, Satan saw that he was losing ground by persecution. So the next church, Pergamum, is the favored church. It's the period of Constantine, where Christianity becomes popular. It becomes the religion of the, of the empire. In fact, the whole empire is baptized, and the doors of the church are opened to all. The church that was in the valley of persecution now is at the heights or elevation. Religion becomes easy. Persecution ceases. It becomes fashionable to become a Christian. Standards are lowered to allow the entrance of half-converted multitudes who bring in the customs and practices of the world with them. Are you catching the picture? The devil learns. The devil is not a dummy. The devil knows that persecution is not the way to do it. In fact, at the end time, the devil is going to work the opposite. He's going to lead as many as he can into apostasy, and persecution will be his last resort. You see, he's learned that persecution doesn't do it. So he says, in the end time, I'm going to create all kinds of, of apostasy, all kinds of false doctrines and false practices to lead the churches astray, and then whoever does not adopt these practices, persecution will be the final solution. The question is, do we as Seventh-day Adventists have anything to learn from this? Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We'll be, read verses 1 through 6, and then we will read verse 11. It says there in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. See, you have all of these blessings of God, water from the rock, manna from heaven, God leading them, baptizing them in the Red Sea, burying all their enemies in the waters. God speaks of all of his blessings, but now notice verse 5. But with most of them, God, most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now, why were these things written? Notice verse 6. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. This is a reference to the manna episode, isn't it? So it's written for us. Now let's notice what it continues saying. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And then verse 11, why were these things written? Why do we have these stories in the Old Testament? Now all these things happened to them as examples. The Greek word is types. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. You see, we are also on a journey from Egypt to Canaan, from the world to heaven. What is the purpose of this journey that we're taking? Is it not to purge ourselves from worldly customs and habits, from the dress of the world, the music of the world, the dance of the world, jewelry of the world, entertainment of the world, the food of the world, the language of the world, the idols of the world? Is it not to discard everything that is offensive to God to prepare ourselves for entering the heavenly Canaan? You see, folks, Heaven is going to be radically different than here. If we do not prepare for heavenly life here, we would be miserable up there. There will be no McDonald's up there. Just to make a point, this present wilderness journey is a preparation and a training for our heavenly home so that we can arrive a healthy, happy, holy people. Why is the church not persecuted today? I read a statement in our previous presentation. I want to read that again. There is another and more important question that should engage the attention of the churches today. The Apostle Paul declares, 
all who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Why is it then that persecution seems in a great degree to slumber? The only reason, one reason, the only reason is that the church has conformed to the world's standard and therefore awakens no opposition. Religion, the religion which is current in our day, is not of the pure and holy character that marked the Christian faith in the days of Christ and his apostles. It is only because of the spirit of compromise with sin, because the great truths of the word of God are so indifferently regarded, because there is so little vital godliness in the church, that Christianity is apparently so popular with the world. And then she states this, let there be a revival of the faith and power of the early church and the spirit of persecution will be revived and the fires of persecution will be rekindled. What is it that leads to the persecution of the church? The fact that the church is living a pious life, a life in harmony with God's will. Why isn't the church suffering persecution? Ellen White says the only reason is because the church has conformed to the world and does not raise up any opposition. Now let me talk a little bit about the task of evangelism. There's a parable of Jesus that says that there's going to be tares and wheat in the church till the very end. But this does not mean that we're supposed to plant the tares in the church. And that's what we're doing, I believe. There will be tares and there will be wheat. But it doesn't mean that we plant the tares in the church. What am I talking about? The fact is that evangelism has five stages. And I like to compare it with uh, an, an illustration of the conception of a child and the birth of a child and the growth of a child. The five stages are, number one, planning evangelistic events. First of all, the church has to have a plan of how to reach out to the community. Second is the moment of conception. That's the moment in which the church touches with the plans somebody from outside the church. It could be a Bible study, it could be a health seminar, whatever it is. Number three, you have the period of gestation. That's the period where people are in contact with the church, they're growing. They're growing in their knowledge of the message and in their relationship with the Lord. Four, you have birth. And five, you have growth. Now let me ask you this. Have you ever heard of a baby that is, uh, that is conceived, or rather, yeah, that is conceived and born on the same day? Anybody ever heard of a baby that's been conceived and born on the same day? That's ridiculous. Is there a period of growth before birth? Yes. How long is the normal period? Nine months. Now let me ask you, should there be a gestation period for people who are, joined the Seventh -day, are going to join the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Before their birth. The birth is the baptism, right? Born of the water and of the Spirit, Jesus said. So must there be a normal gestation period, growth before the baptism, before the birth? Absolutely. Why would we want to deliver a preemie baby? Why not lead a baby to full term? Are you following me or not? The gestation period is a period that the person is in contact with the church, learning the doctrines of the church, learning the lifestyle that God expects, and then when they reach the point where they've come to the point of growth where they should be, then you have the birth or the baptism. And then after the baptism comes the hard work, the growth. I believe that Seventh-day Adventist evangelism is failing primarily in two areas. Not in the period of plant, uh, the, the part that has to do with plants. We've got bunches of plans to reach out to the community. Bunches of different Bible studies, health seminars, and uh, you know, stress seminars, and, and so on. Lots of plans. I don't think we have any problems with conceptions. You know, the, the, the idea, you know, of uh, uh, touching people where they are. 
I don't think we have any problem with births. You know, there's a lot of emphasis on baptizing, baptizing, and baptizing. And I have no problems with that. As long as there is a normal what? A normal gestation period where they're studying the Bible and they're uh, getting acquainted with the message of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So in the Adventist Church, you know, we have lots of plans. In the Adventist Church, we have uh, lots of conceptions, the church making contacts with the people in society. But I think that we're failing when it comes to the gestation period. We want to rush into baptizing people. And as a result, we deliver preemies, they get weak, they leave the church, and many of them die. We don't have any problems with births in the Adventist church. There are scores of baptisms and births. The second place where we have troubles in Adventist evangelism, besides the gestation period, is the growth period. Because people come into the church, and then we tell the people, hey, uh, welcome to the family, and then we leave them to themselves. Let me ask you, does a newborn baby require a lot of care? Do you have to change dirty diapers? Do you have to change dirty diapers of new members? You better believe it. Do new members cry a lot? Yeah, so what do you do? You spank them, right, for crying? No! <laughs> you know, what, what you do is you hug them, and you try to help them, don't you? Are new members able to feed themselves? No! For a while you got to feed them, see, until they grow and they're able to feed themselves. And so I believe that where we're failing many times in evangelism is in the gestation period, the growth before the baptism and the birth, and the growth period after the person has been baptized. And as a result, we have sickly members many times, a mixed multitude that brings their habits into the church. Let me read you this statement from Ellen White so that you see that this is not me. The accession of members who have not been renewed in heart and reformed in life is a source of weakness to the church. Did you catch that? The accession, that means the entrance, of members who have not been renewed in heart and reformed in life, not only renewed in heart, but reformed in life, is a source of weakness to the church. This fact is often ignored. Some ministers and churches are so desirous of securing an increase of numbers that they do not bear faithful testimony against unchristian habits and practices. Those who accept the truth are not taught that they cannot safely be worldlings in conduct while they are Christians in name. That's a mixed multitude, by the way. Heretofore, they were Satan subjects, henceforth they are to be subjects of Christ. The life must testify to the change of leaders. Public opinion favors a profession of Christianity. Little self-denial or self-sacrifice is required in order to put on a form of godliness and to have one's name enrolled upon the church book. Hence, many join the church without first becoming united with Christ. In this, Satan triumphs. Wow. So when people come into the church that are not well prepared, Satan triumphs. Such converts are his most efficient agents. What were the most efficient agents in the time of Israel? The mixed multitude. What about in the times of the history of the Christian church? The period of Constantine. She continues writing. In this, Satan triumphs. Such converts are his most efficient agents. They serve as decoys to other souls. They are false lights, luring the unwary to perdition. It is in vain that men seek to make the Christian's path broad and pleasant to worldlings. God has not smoothed or widened the rugged, narrowed way. If we would enter into life, we must follow the same path which Jesus and his disciples trod, the path of humility, self-denial, and sacrifice. Five Testimonies, page 172. Here's another one. The Spalding McGann Collection, page 260. Half-hearted Christians are worse than infidels. Did you catch that? Half-hearted Christians are worse than infidels. 
for their deceptive words and non-committal position lead many astray. The infidel shows his colors, secular person shows his colors. The lukewarm Christian deceives both parties. He is neither a good worldling nor a good Christian. Satan uses him to do a work that no one else can do. The final test is coming, folks. The final test is coming upon this world. And there's going to be a shaking. Those who are half-hearted Christians will be shaken out. And God will have a pure, peculiar people. I end by reading from Five Testimonies, page 81, about this final testing time. The time is not far distant when the test will come to every soul. The mark of the beast will be urged upon us. Those who have, now listen carefully, those who have step by step yielded to worldly demands and conformed to worldly customs will not find it a hard matter to yield to the powers that be rather than subject themselves to derision, insult, threatened imprisonment, and death. The contents, contest is between the commandments of God and the commandments of men. In this time, the gold will be separated from the dross in the church. True godliness will be clearly distinguished from the appearance and tinsel of it. Many a star that we have admired for its brilliancy will then go out in darkness. Chaff like a cloud will be borne away on the wind, even from places where we see only floors of rich wheat. All who assume the ornaments of the sanctuary but are not clothed with Christ's righteousness will appear in the shame of their own nakedness. The day is coming when the mixed multitude will be shaken out, and clearly the world will see only two groups. The mixed multitude will join the worldlings, and there will be only two groups. Those who are faithful to God, being willing to give up their own lives because they want to remain faithful, and those who have given in to worldly demands, and they have become fully worldlings. That is what is going to happen at the very end of time. May God bless us and help us to be among that group that remain firm, solid, a peculiar people that can give a witness, a powerful witness to this world.